afternoon everybody. If I got the topic right, um, the, the topic this afternoon is gender and the labour market. And if I didn't get it right, you're going to get the paper that I've produced anyway. So. <laughs> um, so our topic this afternoon is gender and the labour market. And the debates centre mostly on the sources and impact of inequality in the labour market. I want to start by telling you briefly about a conversation I had with a branch secretary of mine when I was, um, and I still am active in, 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 in the trade union movement. But he called me into the office, go back a couple of years, and he said, and he said, would you like the branch nomination to be on the National Women's Committee? And I said, no, but I'd like the nomination to be on the National Executive Committee. Now, hence, I didn't get the nomination, but, but I still remained an activist. The struggle against inequality is an important one, and one in which there has been considerable gains. But it's also the, sort of, the, the source of considerable muddle, and even what I suggest might be called the equality delusion. It's this delusion and how we can move beyond it that's the subject of my talk today. The slogan of the French Revolution, the source of so many of our ideas on political democracy, was liberty, equality and fraternity. Now Marx pointed out that the revolution did pretty well with liberty and equality but less well with the fraternity aspect. And this is because liberty and equality dealt with the relations between the state and the individual and with political and legal rights. Fraternity, on the other hand, the social content of political life in today's language, was an instant opposition to the rights of private property. So Marx argued, however democratic the form capital society might take, Capitalist class domination made fraternity an impossibility. Marx's answer to this problem meant going beyond the limits of capitalist democracy to social democracy, socialism as, as we should say now. When we consider the connections between gender and labour markets today, I think that Marx's starting point is still the most important. It's most important because it helps us, helps us dispel what I have already referred to as the equality delusion. <coughs> so what is the equality delusion? Or what do I mean when I talk about the equality delusion? The equality delusion is the proposition that we can achieve the fraternity part of the French slogan by perfecting liberty and equality parts. The equality delusion is the idea <coughs> that all issues of equity have legal solutions. That is, that they can be solved by perfecting bourgeois rights within the framework of a capitalist society. So let's take an example. Women's suffrage was in many ways the major unfinished business of the bourgeois revolution. But for many of its most effective proponents, suffrage was not an end in itself, but a, a necessary step in a broader transformation of, of, of society. The working class socialist suffrage movement, which, which James Connolly was so closely associated with, shared that um, legislative objective with very little else with their middle class sisters. For women, as for others, liberty and equality are never complete, or at least never safe from attack. Now the reason the left engages with the completion or sometimes regeneration of the purely bourgeois aims of liberty and equality is because quite often they produce the most fertile grounds for a new form of struggle um, in society. But here lies the problem. Because we can only guarantee the gains that we make within a capitalist democracy by transcending it. Now law has a part to play, of course, in improving the position of women in the labour market. But we see so often that the law seems incapable of a definitive, definitive solutions to some issues. The law certainly solved the suffrage issue, but we've had, had had much less success, for example, with pay equality. And it's when we consider the whole aspect of gender and the labour market that we can see most clearly the limitations of, of the equality delusion. Now I suggest that there are two standard ways of looking at continuing disparities between men and women's earnings. One is the failure of regulation laws not well framed or enforced, and the solution, better regulation. 
In this view, pay inequality is due to the exercise of political or cultural power over women by men as a whole and requires the perfection of universal rights. The perfection of these rights might come through the medium of collective organisation, that is through trade union bargaining or political campaigning, but equally it may involve the curtailment of, for example, the role of collective bargaining in favour of a floor of individual rights for all. And I would argue, I think that we can see that clearly today, that it's the national minimum wage that has provided the impetus for the employers to attack for example, registered employment agreements, particularly within the construction and the catering industry. The second way, uh, way of looking at pay disparities is to see them as a reflection of labour market forces, <coughs> which are not readily amenable to legal regulation. And that is, except in the sense of discouraging ways of behaviour that distorts the labour market. In other words, less regulation. The market will establish the equilibrium, and if one was to be facetious, we could say that the current banking crisis is a prime example of this. In other words, the only regulation permissible is the, is the one that which makes the, the, the market more effective. In practice, um, of course, both views are reconciled in legislation, requiring equal pay for work of equal value. Women's pay will be equal to men when constraints on the efficient operation of labour markets are removed. Among those limits are the powers exercised by sectional interest groups, which include, of course, trade unions. Deal with those constraints and any persistent inequalities of outcome reflect real differences in productivity rather than sex discrimination. So in other words, equality or exploitation. This legislation deals with rights in the context of a class society and in a way that must operate within, protect and reinforce the interests of the ruling class, in this case making the market work. However, as we know, market forces are not natural forces, although sometimes they often appear as such, but they reflect the consequences of a class society. They are the concrete expression of labour status as a commodity and of the separation of the producer from the means of production. They're not illusions, they can't be wished away and no, nor can their consequences. Citroen, a, a British trade union leader in the 20s and 30s, and I think he later became a lord, um, and he's not somebody that I frequently quote, but I think he outlined this particularly well when he said, that capitalism secretes unemployment in the same way that the liver secretes bile. That was a very <laughs> nice <laughs> turn of phrase. The same can be said for all uh, forms of inequality, and especially economic inequality and exploitation. The position of women in the labour market, their pay, whole occupations segregated by sex, etc., cannot be abstracted from capitalist exploitation. Now many critics of the trade union movement see them as sectional interests, pure and simple. And in the same vein, some feminists make a lot about trade unions as organisations of male power and, um, over women. But let's note two things. Firstly, and in general, studies of the outcomes of collective bargaining in the first three quarters of the 20th century clearly showed that a major outcome was the compression of earnings through relatively better deals for the lower paid, and this mostly came about through the trade union movement. And that, of course, means women too. Second, and in particular, the first equal pay legislation in the UK, the Equal Pay Act of 1970, which was the precursor for EU and this Irish uh, legislation, was the direct consequences of a strike by the women's, women's sewing machines at Ford's factories in Dagenham in, in 1968. And I don't know whether you, you know this, but you, you may do. But they've just made a, a film on the Dagenham workers, and I think it's out for release uh, this month, so it might be worth uh, one to keep our, our eye open for. It should be no surprise that inequality is as unequally distributed as pay. Women in our society 
are the largest group by far suffering from additional exploitation and oppression on top of that experienced by the working class as a whole. And in James Conley's uh, phrase, the worker is the slave of the capitalist society, the female worker is the slave of that slave. This leaves women with the abiding necessity to assert themselves and their interest in all political and economic matters. It means that women can legitimately use self-organisation to secure a voice in debate and a place in that action. But this is not only a struggle for women, and it's certainly not a struggle to ensure that women are equally exploit exploited and oppressed as men. Meaningful change for the majority of women, as for the majority of men, comes from a struggle for a changed society. Now that struggle requires working class unity. But working class unity doesn't drop from heaven, nor is it available in an easy to assemble uh, flat pack form. Solidarity is based on the common experience of exploitation, but it's only produced by a conscious activity. So for example, when members of trade unions are involved in collective action, this is an example I would suggest of a conscious activity, however limited, it, however limited it might be around a particular issue, and a point I will return to. Solidarity works against many pressures for disunity, sex, race, skill, nationality, etc. But let's return to the trade unions and solidarity for a moment, in particular to that strike in Dagenham. The women machinists at Ford went on strike over a pay deal agreed by the Transport General Workers Union. And that was done in the persons of the local official and the convener of the shop stewards committee at Dagenham. The women's argument that their work was under undervalued so impressed the convener that he reneged on his own agreement and backed and supported the, the, this, the women's strike. And this is the interesting thing for me. Here we saw women in economic struggle fighting with their union, but also within their union to produce a progressive result for workers everywhere. And which in turn, of course, extended the legal rights of all women, which I referred to earlier on uh, the Equal Pay Act of 1970. Here we also see um, the insight Conley gave us when he argued that none so fetched for workers, none so, um, fetid to break the chains as those who wear them, none so well equipped to decide what a fetter is. Conley shows us the way out of the false and, and, and limiting distinction between political and economic activism and between forms of social organisation that get away <coughs> and those that build a deeper unity amongst working class people. This interface, to use a buzzword, between markets and social activism is a key to understanding what's happening to women in the labour market. Now, I'm not going to use statistics today, um, but they're already available for those of you who might want to examine them in, in greater detail. But I do want to look briefly at the um, current economic crisis and, and how it affects women. The first wave of job losses was mainly concentrated in the construction industry and the associate, associated manufacturing. The construction industry collapse <coughs> resulted in huge increases in the number of males signing on the live register. The second wave of unemployment was in light manufacturing and in the service sector, which is predominantly women's employment, and those industries are characteristically low paid. This was then followed by a savage attack on public sector workers, where again, <laughs> there are a significant number of women employed, particularly in the lower grade area. So many of them saw their, cuts, their pay cuts by over 20%, and we can all take bets that the government aren't finished yet. They want increased productivity and significant changes in work practice. In other words, a lot more for less. And nobody's giving any odds that there won't be further pay cuts in whatever form it takes in the December budget. Now all of these economic and political developments affect women disproportionately as compared to men. But there's a social interest here too. It's not just a sectional issue dressed up to be a social interest. 
in my view, many of the unresolved um, aspects of the bourgeois revolution arise in part because the capitalist class portrays its own sectional interest as human or social interest, and I'll, I'll expand on that now in, in a minute. <coughs> I do care that people aren't paid the, the reunion rate for the job, and I do no, care that many women find themselves in low-paid sectors, and it is an issue that is, there's rising unemployment amongst women. But what I'm not that interested in is how many women are chief executives, or how many women are human resource managers. The debate on equality is too often based on sectional interest, i.e. women breaking the glass ceiling, rather than a social interest. But when we look, and I think this is, this is, this is um, an important point, when we look at rights and interests of these women who are unemployed when no pay job, what do we mean and whose rights are we talking about? Or where do we adopt the term rights from? It is the interest of the capitalist class, from the monopolist to the small business person who's resentful of monopoly capital, but is also eager to achieve that monopoly. And we've seen loads of calls from Isney small business and quite reactionary calls of late for them around uh, people being paid too much for the job. Is it then that we take our vision of rights from? Well, that group, although in a very small minority, have been very successful in establishing their version of morality during the current crisis. And the, a prime example of this is how RT covered the whole issue of public sector pay cuts and reform. And I'm not just talking about the Joe Duffy type shows here, I'm talking about what should be the serious media where, there's, uh, where there was uh, no proper debate. They generally started off the interview with saying, but aren't your members, because inevitably it was a, a, a union official, aren't your members lucky to have a job? So that was the, that was the level of the debate that we had in, on, on our, our prime media. The interest, of, the interest and rights of this class enforced this subjugation of not just women, but working class men and women. The morality they wish to imply is clearly based on their own interests, and they seek to make their interests the national norm. Now rights are very important, but we should understand them as Connolly did when he argued that our view of rights in a capitalist society cannot be divorced from class interest. And, and finally, because I, I think my time is, is, is nearly up here, <laughs> Um, the debate and the actions for equality continues. The sectional interests in a capitalist society are and always will be present. The capitalist class will continue to impose their version of rights on us. And here's the real crux. The relations within the capitalist means of production can't reconcile equality easily. The fight for equality takes place in whatever arena is necessary. But for the ultimate fight to be successful, we need to transcend the capitalist society. Just as Connolly identified struggle as the arena in which labour and feminism find common ground, unity between women and male workers is something which is not theorised into existence, but develops from mutual experience and the processes of struggle. Remember that story I told at the beginning about my branch secretary not getting the nomination? Well, I think, for me anyway, that illustrated the tension that women face all the time in trade unions and in political parties and other organisations. It seems that women have to choose between women's issues or social issues. Now, everything I have said today argues that this is a false dilemma and a false proposition. Women can only have a change in their position if the world, if they change the world in which they live. Okay, thank you very much.